Hallelujah. Luke chapter 13. That's where we'll be going from this morning. Uh, again, I'm so happy to see everybody here. Uh, we're in the we're in a growth stage. Visitors come in at virtually every service. And uh, even on midweek, we had a great crowd here Wednesday night. Amen. I, I, I have felt in the Holy Ghost uh, to, uh, to really try to encourage those that are, for whatever reason, are unable to make it on midweek service to really strive to be here. I, uh, uh, and this is, this is not meant as an insult at all, but generally speaking, the core of your church is who you have on midweek service. Uh, I mean, that, that's not a condemnation on anybody, but that's across all denominational uh, boundaries. And generally, folks that come on midweek service will allow you to pastor them while folks that just come sporadically are just looking for a preacher. Does that make sense? Huh? And... Uh, uh, I'll be whatever you let me be. Amen. But you got to have a pastor in your life. You have to have a pastor in your life, and and uh, I uh, I look forward to that opportunity to uh, to be that for you. And uh, I am. I, I just I, the Lord is just doing so much right now. And Brother Pete, I've kind of, it's kind of like, uh, uh, I did a dumb thing one time. And some of you may have done it before. But me and some of my buddies, uh, and this is what I'm talking about, how the Holy Ghost is doing right now. And this may be a poor illustration, but I think you'll understand it. Me and some of my buddies, guys that lived in the neighborhood, I don't even remember whose car it was. But we rode around the block, Brother David, on the hood. Has anybody else ever done that before? Climb on the front of a car? Boy, that's dumb. Oh, my goodness, that's dumb. But as a matter of fact, Sister Mary, we turned the corner there on Diggs, and Brother Doyle's truck, you know, parked right there. And I'm on the edge by the antenna, and I've got a hold of it. And I started going when he turned the curve. You all know where I was going, don't you? off the hood of the car and you feel yourself slipping and slipping and then finally what do you do you just let go and whatever happens happens just feel like that no need to hold it back just just let it happen and then we'll ride it out that's what's happening in the holy ghost right now brother pete i, I just feel like that i just got to let go and just let the holy ghost carry us where he's going to carry us to amen just let the, let the Spirit take over and just carry us where He wants to, bring whoever He wants to, and we're going to minister through the power of the Holy Ghost. God's doing great things, not only in our church, but in individuals' lives. I told you, we had, we had 20, 23, 24, 25, something like that in prayer meeting Monday night. You just will not believe what's going to happen as a result of that many people coming together to pray, to pray. But it's not because they want to be a part of a group. It's because we desire a relationship with God for me. And if I get me right, then I'm helping the body. Hallelujah. Luke 13 said all that to say what I'm about to say to you. He spake also this parable, verse number 6. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Everybody say it. Cut it down. I'll be honest with you, Brother Robbie. When I read that, it scared me a little bit. 
When I read that, just those three words, Brother Pete, it kind of, whoa, took, set me back a little bit. And I thought, hold up. I don't, I don't like that very much. Huh? I, I don't like that very much. That, that, I, I kind of get the same, the same thing when I read, depart from me, ye worker of iniquity, I never knew you. And they cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I kind of feel the same. You know, they say the chill you get when somebody walks over your grave. That's, that's kind of what I feel like when I read, cut it down. Then he says, why cumbereth it the ground? But he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, then it's good. Well, and if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. This is a strong admonition to Israel. And because it is in Scripture, it is a strong admonition to us as well. As to the necessity of fruitfulness. Let's back up just a little bit to the preceding story to lay a little bit of groundwork for what the Lord is saying to this group of people that are around him. The first verse says, there were present at that season some that told him, they were speaking to Jesus, of the Galileans, a group of people from Galilee, from around the shores of Galilee, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So undoubtedly, from the scriptures here, there were some Galileans, that is the area that Jesus Christ was raised up in, who were offering sacrifices, which is a religious ritual that they had to do according to the Bible. And Brother Robbie, while they were offering them, Pilate, for whatever reason, the same Pilate that Jesus stood before, killed them in the very place, Brother David, where they were offering sacrifice. Now, we have to understand the way of thinking back in those days. And it is a way of thinking, quite honestly, it's a way of thinking that some have today, but it was very predominant even in the early 1900s. But if something goes wrong in your life, it is because you have sin in your life. That's a line of thinking. That's not a good doctrine I'm preaching, okay, because I don't believe that. Now, sometimes junk goes wrong in our life because of decisions we make that put us in certain places. But the Lord does not say, well, you didn't do it my way, so... He don't operate that way. Many people think he does. He doesn't operate that way. But that was the, that was the way of thinking, especially in that day. And they, they're bringing up these people, these Galileans who undoubtedly were obedient to the word because, Brother Pete, they were offering sacrifices to the Lord, blood sacrifices, but they were killed, they were destroyed while they were in fact doing a work for the Lord. And Jesus answering said unto them, suppose ye, or, or do you suppose that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? And then he says, I tell you nay, which means that's not the case at all. But except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then Jesus relates to them a story. And he says, are those 18, 18 folks? Neither of these stories are recorded elsewhere in the Bible. But are these 18 upon, upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? So you think that because the tower fell on them, that is a sign that they were a sinner. He said, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. Now, 
The necessity of repentance is very clearly stated. How many of you know if you're going to be successful in living for God, then it's going to involve repentance? From the beginning until the end. We must, Brother Rice, die out to the flesh. If we fail to die out to the flesh, we will be led by the flesh and we will forfeit our relationship with God because as many as are led by the Spirit shall be called the sons of God. The people that came to him, as I stated earlier, were stuck in the old way of thinking. So in a manner of speaking, they were casting condemnation or aspersions on those that were slain by Pilate that they must have had something wrong in their life. They must have been no good because of what happened to them. I'm happy to tell you, sometimes we just go through trials. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust, but you can rest assured, no matter what's going on in your life, God is still good, God is still on the throne, and God is still in authority and power. God is still in charge. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life, the Lord is in control. Don't let the devil try to tell you that God is weak, that God's power has failed. Don't let the devil try to tell you you're doomed and defeated. God is in control. Control. God is in control. Remind it to yourself. No weapon that's formed against me shall prosper. No weapon. So no matter, Brother Mark, what I'm going through right now, I can read the back of the book. And the back of the book says, I win. I win. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Jesus, recognizing their insinuation, emphatically stated that those that died or those that perished or those that died in an accident were not sinners. But speaking into the lives of all those around him, he lets them know of the necessity of repentance in their own lives because they were standing here looking into the lives of the Galileans and the 18 that died and declaring them to be sinners because of what was going on in their life. Jesus, in fact, declared those that were saying that to be in need of repentance. Because he said, and I want to reiterate this to you and will again, except you, that's, he's talking to them, Brother David. He said, except you repent, you will likewise perish in some form or the other. Doesn't mean Pilate's going to kill them, and it doesn't mean that a tower's going to fall on them, but it means that unless you repent and turn toward God, you will not prosper. But you will fail. Then he segues into the parable that was our text. And we must remember that the theme, the focus of his comments is repentance. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. It's very evident from the scripture that this wasn't a volunteer tree. Brother McKinney, it just didn't come up randomly. But it was planted for a purpose. If you'll let me, I'm going to minister to you this morning. Each and every one. What does the Bible say that, that the church is? The body of Christ. And you are all members. What's it say? One body. Members in particular. We make up the body. The owner planted a fig tree in his vineyard. Because he wanted to benefit from the fruit of the tree. 
We know that because the Bible says that he came and sought fruit. He's looking for fruit from the tree and found none. How many of you know, Lord help me if I go to meddling and stuff, I just need help. How many of you know you either are or you aren't? You're either in or you're out. Brother David taught us well several months ago. He makes it very clear, Brother David, what he's going to do with people that just try to hang around in the middle. What did he say he'll do? Said he'll vomit you right out of his mouth. You're either in the body of Christ, you're either a fully functioning saint, Christian, child of God, or you're not. Okay? That, that in itself is not casting aspersions. It just is what I'm, I, for one, am grateful that there's not any gray area in the kingdom of God. Brother Rice, I'm either in or I'm not. I'm either a fully functioning part of the body or I'm not. And it's my responsibility. He's, oh mercy, he's done all he came to do. That's why he said on the cross, it is finished. I've done the work I came to do. The, he entered in once behind the veil. One sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. The keeper of the vineyard came and found no fruit on the tree. And then he tells, my God have mercy. Oh, come on, Holy Ghost, help me. Lord, Lord, Lord. He tells the dresser, the keeper of the vineyard, I have been here now three years. Three different seasons, Brother Pete, of expectation. I've been coming back the first year, and I found nothing. Then the second year, I said, surely when I come back, I'll find it. But he said, Brother David, I came back the second time, there was nothing. Now I've been back three years checking this tree, and there's no fruit. Three years, many seasons. Oh, come on, somebody, grasp a hold of this. Many rains, much nutrients in the ground, every opportunity to produce. But he said, I found none. And then he says the scary statement. Cut it down. Let me say this. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of grace. But God is also a God that keeps his promises. And throughout time, Brother Pete, he told us in the beginning, the first time that he got aggravated and fed up, in Genesis chapter number 6, what did he say? I will not always strive with man. And then the flood came. Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Brother McKinney, he tells us, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Cut it down. We have covered over. We have band-aided. We have put salve on. We have, we have, for a lot of, for all practical purposes, we have hid this aspect of the kingdom of God. Now, I preach a gospel that whosoever will, but sometimes they won't.
In, in, in one manner of speaking, that's what Jesus did at Nazareth, Brother Rice. He tried. The rain came. He dug. The fertilizer was there, Brother Robbie, but he couldn't do anything. Sometimes it just can't happen. He told the disciples, Brother Pete, he said, you go into a city. You offer them what you have to offer. But if they won't receive you, shake the dust of your feet off and go to the next city. This happened. Jesus leaves Nazareth. The Bible said he could do no great work there. Read it in your Bible. And then he went to Capernaum, healed them all. Let me tell you something. I want a Capernaum experience with God. I'm not satisfied with a little bit of sporadic blessing or touch here, but Brother Dole, I'm ready for everybody to get what they need from God because we can. It's available. The opportunity is there. Whosoever will, let them come. For the promises unto you and your children. As many as the Lord our God shall call, he calls them all. The Bible said he's not slack concerning his promise, as some would count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. But the Lord said, cut it down. But then, notice what comes next. Why cumbereth it? The ground. It has received all the benefits of the vineyard. Three years, many seasons, life, then death, then life, then death, then life, then death. That's the way that it works, is it not? Green and then brown, green and then brown, and then nothing. There's a cycle. There's cycles that we go through in life. But that's why we've got to realize something, saints of God. No matter where you are in your life, no matter what the cycle is, no matter if you're on, come on, help me. If you're, mm, if you're on the mountain or if you're in the valley, it doesn't matter if you're in health or if you're in affliction. It doesn't matter where you are. The important thing is, is you realize God's in control. And we are all just in seasons in our life. But the beautiful thing about seasons, Brother Pete, is they always change. That's why it's important. I preached it last week. It's important that your faith fail not. Faith in God. Just hold on. If I can tell anybody anything, just hold on. Life and death, rain and sunshine, nutrients. It's received everything in hand. There has been nothing happened with the fig tree. It is simply unfruitful. Now understand this. The tree cannot just decide to grow fruit. That's not how it works. The tree's not holding out, Brother Pete. The tree hasn't the tree has no will, no conscience. It's alive. But it has no will. It either grows or it doesn't. So how does this apply to us? I was hoping you would ask that. We're the trees. We have been planted in this vineyard. Now think about this. Not for our benefit, but for his. We have been planted in this vineyard, this vineyard, for the benefit of the one that owns it. And the tree is planted to produce. A fig tree was planted to produce figs. So a child of God, likewise, must produce fruit. The message of the Lord, remember, they're showing up and saying the Galileans was all sinners. The 18 that died, they were all sinners. But the message of the Lord must be received that a lack of production requires repentance.
A lack of production means you're going in the wrong direction. Because if God's the same, then you can bear fruit regardless of what season you're in. If God's the same. The trees or the people of God must become fruitful. A lack of fruitfulness is, not a, is a result of inadequacy in the tree, not in the vineyard. So what is the fruit that the Lord's looking for from us? Galatians 5 and 22 tells us very plainly. But the fruit of the Spirit is. And Brother David and I have discussed this. I'm not sure if we've ever discussed it in a public setting. But if I say the fruit of the tree is apples, or if I say the fruit of the tree is oranges, or the fruit of the tree is figs, then the tree must produce what it's intended to produce. Is that not correct? You, you don't expect an apple tree to grow plums. Okay? A tree is put there for a purpose, and likewise we are put here for a purpose, and we are to show the fruit of the Spirit. So we are spirit trees. Brother Pete, the fruit of the Spirit is... Notice that doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. But as there's one Spirit, everybody that is full of the Spirit should bear the same fruit. Oh, I'm liking the them amens now. That'll get you to preaching. And the fruit of the Spirit Brother McKinney, there's just one spirit. One spirit. That's the spirit of God Almighty. Oh, I know there's other spirits that roam around, but there's only one that puts this fruit off. Love. Joy. Peace. Long-suffering. Gentleness. Goodness. Faith. Meekness, temperance, against such, there is no law. The law of the nature, law of nature says that a fig tree should produce figs. The law of the spirit says that a spirit-filled person should produce fruit. We don't decide to produce fruit. You don't just wake up one morning, Brother David, and say, I'm going to show love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance. Just like the fig tree can't decide to produce figs. But Brother Shannon, when we get full of the Spirit, it just happens. I read a story the other day. This illustrates it perfectly. I was going to preach a whole message about it, Brother Billy. I believe it was Torrey Hunter that plays outfield for the Detroit Tigers. He's told of a story talking about the, the intangible things that make up a ball team, the, the things that Brother, Brother Pete that money can't buy, that just the heart, the, 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 the guts, Brother Billy. And he said, I remember a story when I was a little boy. And... We'd be out in the yard, and we used to do this too. Many of you may have done it as well. But we'd be out in the yard on a hot summer night, and there would be flashes of light all over the yard. And we would run around trying to catch them and put them in a jar. Now, city slickers call them fireflies. They're really lightning bugs. But Tory Hunter asked his grandpa. He said, Grandpa, why do they light up? And grandpa said, 
because it's just in them. It's just in them. Why do we show the fruit of the Spirit? Because it's in us. It's because it's in us. That's why, Brother Pete, I must have the Spirit of God within me. If I am going to, because if I read this parable correctly, Brother Terry, that he comes searching for fruit. Brother David, the Bible even talks one place about pruning, plucking the fruit. There's a time, Brother Rice, he's coming looking for fruit. He ain't looking for your money. He ain't looking for your talent. He's not looking for all the things we try to dress ourselves up with as effective Christians. Because anybody knows somebody, you don't have to be right with God to be able to bear down on the guitar or play the piano. But to show the fruit of the Spirit, saints of God, is evidence of the Holy Ghost putting all inside of you. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's why we don't pray for the fruit of the Spirit. Right? We pray to be full of the Spirit. For the Holy Ghost to operate in us. It's a natural occurrence. So the way that we become more fruitful is get more of the Spirit. The answer is in the Holy Ghost. That's why we can never try to fall back on our own abilities, our own talents, but we must allow the Spirit of God to work through us. Is there a reason the owner says, why? Does it cumber the ground? That word cumber means idleness or inactivity. And he says, is there a reason to leave it here? Because all it's doing right now, Brother McKinney, is taking up space. Half of what? No, sir. That's why we can't just, just decide to let love, joy, and peace show through us. Because either you have it, we have often tried to, tried to say that, that you don't have to go back there. You know, that the fruits of the Spirit, like you get part of it, but you don't get the other part. That'd be like, how many of you ever see an apple tree full of half of apples? We don't see it. So verse number 8. Verse number 8. And he answering said unto him, Lord, That's very important right there because first thing you got to do is re recognize we're not in charge. But he is. There's one Lord. One Lord. One God who's in control. He says, Lord, let it alone this year also, give it one more year, one more chance, one more opportunity. This is a type of the advocate. This is a type of what Jesus was for us, the intercessor, the one that stood in the gap. Now remember, he, he's speaking here to Israel. Brother Rice, they took great pride in being religious. They were Abraham's seed. They were the covenant people. And they thought that by virtue, by virtue of who their mama was or by virtue of who their daddy was, they was automatically saved. Read it, it's there. According to the bloodline, but Jesus Christ was ushering in a new way of thinking. And Brother Robbie, it involved allowing the Spirit to lead you. They wanted to be led by tradition. They wanted to be led by entitlement. Those days are over, honey. 
I don't care if you was born on one of these church pews. You are going to have to forge out your own walk with God and allow the Holy Ghost to begin to work through you. They had taken so much pride in their privilege that they had neglected their responsibility. And you know what? Oh, mercy. What did Jesus say to them? What has he already said to them twice? Repent! Or else you'll perish. So what does that mean, Brother Pete? That means keep on going the way you're going and you're going to find yourself in the same boat. Repent. Repent. I got to change my ways. Brother McKinney, I hope to goodness that I never get to the place in my life that when the preaching of the word goes forth that I don't feel the Holy Ghost trying to improve me. Yes, sir. The Holy Ghost wants to... I haven't made it yet. I haven't reached maximum effectiveness yet. I want the Word to correct me, to direct me. We have gotten such a sense of entitlement even in our country. We are a Judeo-Christian society. I don't care what the government says. We are a Christian society for the most part. The majority of the people have the Christian values and morals and principles that the Bible says. I don't care what the media tells you. Most folks are good folks. Now there's a few knuckleheads that get their pictures splashed all over TV and everybody that watches it thinks that's how the whole world is. It's not. It's not. But our... Just because that our forefathers read the Bible all the time and come over here for religious freedom gives us no sense of entitlement just because we're Americans. Our entitlement comes when we're full of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's the citizenship that we must crave. We must crave it. The Jews had taken so much pride in who they were and who their ancestors were that they had neglected the responsibility that came with that privilege. They are being reminded of who is in control. They are being reminded of the mercy of God. But by the same token, also being reminded that God doesn't always strive with man. And they are going to see it, Brother Robbie. What he is telling them is fixing to happen to the Jewish people. He will soon turn from Israel to the Gentile nation. And it was for one reason. Huh? Why does he turn to the Gentiles? Because the Jews refused to repent. And by refusing to change their ways, they had to reject Jesus. They refused. And he is going to soon find himself going to a... He, the Bible said he came into his own and his own received him not. Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah chapter 55 that he will go to a people that he now knows not. Remember this. Now you, oh, mercy. You remember. How many of you know what 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse number 14 says? Brother, Brother David, who was he talking to? He was talking to his original people. He was talking to the Jews. And what did he say? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. They could not grasp that, Brother Robbie. They had had it pounded in them. You're the best. You're the greatest. You're the one. God forbid we ever start thinking that. Because the first thing we ought to do is humble ourselves. How do you humble yourself? First step is repent which is a declaration of not getting it done on my own. This way is not working. I must repent. I must repent. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, 
I will heal their land. The keeper of the vineyard said, Lord, give me the opportunity to dig around the tree. Give me the opportunity to put fertilizer on it. Give me some more seasons. I think, I think if we have one more good rain, I think if I can get some of the stuff that's piled up against the bottom, Brother Pete, if I dig away through some of the things that have piled up over these last few years, if I can just get down a little bit where the, where the word can begin to sink in, where the rain can begin to get down around the roots. Because how many of you know, how many of you know that your fruit is not, not given birth to on the end of the limb, but it's given birth to down inside. And it works its way out and manifests itself in fruit. My message is both to the saint, to the guest, how long you figuring on waiting? Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. But then mercy steps in. Grace steps in. And the opportunity will once again be given for more rain, for more sunshine, for more seasons, for another cycle of growth. But the time will come when the opportunity has passed. Brother Pete, the Bible warns us of it in many cases because they receive not a love for the truth. He'll send them a strong delusion. They'll believe a lie and be damned. The Bible talks about being turned over to a reprobate mind, which means that you cannot even comprehend truth, let alone obey it. The Bible speaks of having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The Bible speaks very clearly of those that try to come any other way. I'll tell you that the path is clear. The way is straight. But when he comes searching, let's stand. How long? You know, this is a terrible illustration too, but I think it'll... How long are we going to keep spinning, spinning the cartridge, playing spiritual Russian roulette with our spiritual lives? How long are we going to continue to take a chance, to take a chance that there's always another day before we, number one, give our life to God, which begins with repentance, or before we break out this shell of mediocrity that has become a comfort to us and stop thinking because we know the truth, because we hear the truth preach that we've arrived. Think about this. He came the first season looking for fruit. He came the second season looking for fruit. He came the third season looking for fruit. You know, Brother David, he was coming the next season. Another cycle of growth. Another time of inspiration. Another time of, of the preaching of the word, the delivery of the word over and over and over and over again. There was a time. There wasn't a famine of the word, Brother McKinney. But there was a famine of hearing the word. Famine of hearing the word of God. Will you heed the call of the Lord? Will he allow the Holy Ghost to do in you what he wishes to do? How many of us battle being miserable and battle being unhappy and battle being unfulfilled in our lives? And we look for it in so many different places when I've come to tell you this morning that completion is only found inside of you. Brother Manning, it's a scary thing. It's a fearful thing to know that it's even in him to say, cut it down. Now, the devil will work on your mind. That'll be the first thing the devil tells you. 
How many can testify to that? That'll be the first thing the devil tells you, you're done. You're through. But Jesus said, give me one more year. Give, give me one more year. I'm going to dig. How, what, what do you have to do to dig, Brother Pete? You've got to break things up a little bit. You've got to get it worked a little bit. And the Lord is trying to do that in some folks' lives. But instead of resisting, embrace it. Because God's going to change your life. I still strongly believe that the power of the Holy Ghost is what the whole world needs. It's what the whole world needs. It's what the whole world needs. And Brother Rice, when he comes searching for me, he didn't notice, he didn't say, break up the whole vineyard. He didn't say, tear it all down. We like to do that. I'm not a fan of it at all. But he said, cut this tree down. I don't want that to ever happen in my life. Do you? Do you? I want the Holy Ghost to be able to operate and work through me. And I want when he comes.